Hey everyone, I will be live in New Orleans Friday evening, May 5th. I'm giving a talk about the way we can help the self activate to facilitate our inner work. Together we'll explore an alchemical process we can use as a guide. It would be great to connect with you in person, face to face, and explore this together. Registering is very easy. Just follow the link to the New Orleans Young Society in the show notes. You'll find it by scrolling down the podcast description on your phone or laptop. I really hope to see you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to explore an emerging character pattern, which people are calling the Dark Triad. And it's described as a combination of Machiavellianism, which is characterized by manipulative, cynical, and opportunistic attitudes towards people and organizations, narcissism, which involves an exaggerated sense of self-importance, a need for admiration and lack of empathy, and psychopathy, which is described as a disregard for others' feelings, impulsiveness, and a tendency towards aggression and antisocial behavior. And the dark triad character is more subtle than the clinical disorders that I just mentioned. This kind of person is reasonably high-functioning and blends into most groups, and they may have outwardly successful lives, but have a negative effect on the people close to them and the organizations they're embedded in. Because these traits are considered subclinical, they're often invisible to the person who is exhibiting them. So dark triad characters do not walk around thinking, I'm a psychopath, or I'm a malignant narcissist, or I'll crush anyone who challenges my authority. Instead, they'll more subtly find an internet platform or a religious sect or a belief system or a social group that validates their worst qualities, that gives them permission to be cruel or hateful or destructive, and the system actually construes those qualities as virtues. So they begin to be convinced that they are fighting for what is right and true, and they're actually finding a way to give free reign to their cruelty and their desire to treat others viciously. And then they'll find allies to cheer them on who also believe they're on the side of everything that's good and right. And if the person, as these tensions begin to build up, the dark triad character will then find specific individuals to go after, to injure, and if the person who's being attacked responds to the provocation with anger, that's now seen as further confirmation that the accusations from the dark triad person are true. So, in this social sphere, the end result is that the dark triad person can deny their own cruelty, sadism, or destructive behavior and simultaneously acted out without restraint, and still in their own minds feel themselves to be on the side of goodness and truth even as they do it. So this is a very tricky mix of self-delusion, social manipulation, and a resistance to growth and change. I think I want to start off at the top with uh, something that's been very helpful to me and is always very clarifying. Maybe this sort of helps us 
a bit as we continue this discussion about this difficult topic. M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, wrote somewhere that people with personality disorders take too little responsibility and people who are neurotic take too much responsibility. And I found that just a very helpful, clear, obviously, you know, sort of super simplified, but but somehow also very clear. So just, just to your point about, you know, these people don't walk around thinking, hey, I'm a malignant narcissist. In general, narcissists don't think they're narcissists either, you know. And for that reason, it is unusual for those people to come into therapy. It's not that it doesn't happen, but in general, they don't come in. And it's more often neurotic people who are taking on too much responsibility for things who come into therapy because they're worried they're doing something wrong or they want help managing these difficult feelings. Whereas if you're, if you're in this mode of sort of deflecting everything and nothing's ever your fault, you're less likely to be interested in doing the introspective reflective work that therapy offers. So maybe just to kind of set that out front. For me, it all goes into a category from a Jungian perspective of the ego development that is the task of the first half of life. We are intended to develop a strong and hopefully flexible and hopefully well-adapted ego. But uh, this dark triad seems to indicate people where uh, ego development has run amok It's become inflated, it's become exaggerated to the detriment especially of uh, relational qualities, of simply being connected uh, without necessarily going into the neurotic spectrum of overvaluing the other, but at least connected, understanding, appreciating, taking into consideration what is the effect I'm having. Uh, on people close to me, people in my organization. Um, So it's a kind of inflated uh, ego orientation, it seems to me, overall, of what I want, how I feel, what I can do. It feels, uh, you know, in a way, very, from an internal point of view, very empty. And I think that when someone with these traits winds up in a situation that is intolerable for them. And often that might happen after midlife, perhaps after some misfortune, uh, a bankruptcy, or getting caught up in some bad situation where all of a sudden somebody begins to ask or become curious about their own pain. And they come in, not impossibly, but they do come in. We often do find there's a sense of the ego being so weak that it's, as you said, Deb, inflated by these various archetypal identifications. And from a Jungian standpoint, when an archetype becomes overly potent in the psyche, it can trick the ego into feeling like it has godlike qualities and that it's not subject to the normal restraints and vulnerabilities, frankly, that all of us as human beings have. So it seems surprising that somebody could manipulate a large company and bilk people out of millions of dollars and get caught because gods never get caught or if they are found out, there's never any repercussions for them. So the inflation you know, puts them in danger and emboldens them. And, you know, Jung talks about just that exact thing. He, he used the terms God. He uses the term godlikeness in in volume seven. He has a couple of essays where he talks about it. Deb, I'm I'm going back to what you were talking about for a minute because you were you were making this distinction about sort of um, you know holding the other in mind, and I like what you said about sort of not overvaluing the relationship, but being able to stay in relationship wonder about how you're affecting the other person. I'm thinking about something that you often bring to us from the world of Gestalt, where you talk about intimate versus strategic systems, that there's a time and a place to be strategic and transactional. You know, it's like when you're ordering your mocha or something at Starbucks, you know, that's, that's a transaction. You're not, you know, deeply invested in what's happening to the person on the other side of the counter. And, and then there are intimate 
systems, like with our, our friends or family or loved ones. If something feels wrong when we're in a strategic encounter and we get overly intimate, just as it feels wrong and is a transgression if we're in an intimate system and we become too transactional. And so, you know, that's almost like another frame to put on this. And of course, it brings in that I think when we're talking about dark triad stuff, what we're what we're really into is the power drive. And that that, that is a hallmark of this personality style, that it's power seeking and and looking to dominate. It's like you're not able to be in that intimate place. I mean, ideally, we can move back and forth between being strategic and intimate and know when to be one way and when to be the other. If you're locked into these dark triad traits, you're only always thinking strategically, what can I get out of this encounter? Yeah, I think that really fits, uh, Lisa. And there probably are two aspects to the relational piece. One is, is the person aware of his or her impact on other people? That That's a cognitive thing that, um, you know, to literalize it, if I stepped on somebody's foot, I'm aware that the person yelped and uh, gave indications of being in pain. And then the second is, you know, how much weight do I give that? You know, is it determinative of what I do next or how do I decide what I'm going to do? Yeah, do I care? <laughs> yeah. And that goes to what you were saying, Joseph, about the godlike uh, inflation around this. Uh, and the, the Greek gods were lots of things, but one thing they were not was reflective. Or related. <laughs> or related. Gods do what they do. There is no uh, awareness or, or value given to what is my impact on people if I uh, insist on having my way, if I insist that we all, you know, uh, succumb to outrage or, you know, take this kind of action. Uh, reflection is one of the five instincts for Jung, and he, he only listed five instincts. And the capacity for reflection, in addition to, you know, sex and hunger and our need for physical activity, it's amazing that reflection is one of those five. That's how important it is. Well, I think the idea of self-reflection in terms of thinking about one's character, is something that the dark triad folks do use, but not in the way that we're talking about here in pro-social ways. Because often dark triad folks are curating a persona that will help them optimize the outcomes that they're looking for. So whether they're trying to have as many romantic conquests as possible, and how to curate a personality to do that, or how to secure as much trust when they're in a sales environment. So they are kind of talking to themselves about themselves, but not necessarily in a way that promotes intimacy. And so I'm particularly interested in the idea of empathy, because while those qualities are certainly related, you know, empathy is that capacity to feel with or to have some kind of a simultaneous emotional experience of the person that you're engaging. So when the person is happy, there's a little moment of happiness inside of us. And if the person is sad, there's actually a nodal point of sadness that begins to resonate like another tuning fork inside of us. And that gives us information, but helps us as well. So lacking that feedback loop, that natural feedback loop, that gives us information about our effect on other people, then it's either disregarded, or we then have to rely on the intellect to come in and sort out the signals which can be very useful, but again, there has to be a determination to acquire that. I'm wondering, too, about the difference that uh, interpersonal in situ interaction makes versus the distance that 
social media allows people to have. Uh, when we have to work with people in a workplace or we're in a neighborhood or our family, that imposes some constraints regardless of, you know, what one's own inner feelings, inner awareness, inner empathy might be. Uh, versus the anonymity that social media permits and nobody will know what you said or how you said it and um, it doesn't feel like a personal interaction. It feels more like this is an opportunity for me to say what I want and do what I want and have the effect that I want. It seems to me it unleashes the power drive very differently. I've often thought that any of the platforms that don't require people to put their real names, their real contact information, and their real photographs on the platform are really just inviting people to bring either their worst qualities or people that already are seeking to do damage to have a place where they can do that without restraint. Well, and there there is this research that says that uh, dark triad traits are really correlated with these online trolls. Although what I think is interesting, I mean, I totally agree with you, both of you, and it's not like people behave so well on Facebook where they do have their names and their pictures. So there's something else going on too about, and, and Deb, it may have to do with what, what you're talking about that you know, there's just this kind of sense of distance. It's a little bit like, you know, when you're in a traffic jam and you can just sort of say, really, you can dehumanize the other drivers, you know, because everyone's <laughs> fairly anonymous, you know. You know, we're just interacting with little, little pictures. We're not interacting with the person right in front of us. And so there is a way that uh, online interaction, I think, has degraded social norms, it's interesting, the uh, paradox here is that it's social interaction and it's also dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. uh, just as other people in a big traffic jam, they're just cars out there. Right. And we may know intellectually each car has a driver, but they're not people, you know, in those situations. They have been downgraded. They've been dehumanized. And one's own ego takes over. I need to get out of here. I need this traffic jam to clear. I need... It's so easy to slip into that. It is so, so easy. And that we all have some of these traits. And any of us that have raised children see in the natural development of children that they'll go through times where they have primary narcissism and it's all about the developing self-esteem or that there's kind of a psychopathic need for arousal and stimulation and exerting power over, or there's a kind of Machiavellian protection of the, the sources of pleasure and satisfaction. So all that stuff dances around, but as the ego evolves, the strategies to secure those things should become more skilled and more sophisticated. And also some of those needs are met by internal representations of, of whatever that represents. It's the symbol-making function in the psyche that begins to meet some part of those needs. So we're not always hammering on the environment to provide them. So one quality that I think is relevant to the whole basket of features in the dark triad is that there's some kind of an emotional dysregulation in the individual that I think was not met in childhood, probably. So they turn out to the environment and they hammer on the environment to make it provide what they didn't get in childhood. And depending on which of the traits is more or less dominant, they'll hammer more intensely on the environment to provide that. So if somebody is suffering from a narcissistic wound, they are hammering on the environment to extract proof that they're valuable, 
proof that they have a laudable sense that they're approved of or envied or highly valued. With the psychopath, they're hammering on the environment and trying to exert enormous power on the environment as a way of securing something that is arousing to them. Because at the seat of the psychopathic character structure is an absolute horrific void. And the Machiavellian person is somehow suffering from a lack of security and pleasurable resources, and so they are going to grab the world and strangle it to make sure that they own the channels through which security and pleasure and resources can flow to them. But all of that, in my estimation, comes from an excruciating lack in the center of the psyche. You know, one of the things that came up for me while you were talking, Joseph, is, uh, you know, in the DSM, I, I think, I mean, it's been a little while since I checked, but I think with uh, narcissism, one of the things they talk about is a kind of shallowness of feeling. I might have this wrong, because I don't look at the DSM very often. But this is almost one of the ways that you kind of uh, can tell a narcissist, is there's a kind of shallowness to the to feeling. There's a superficiality, which I think speaks to this, you know, what you're talking about, this sense of void or emptiness or lack. You know, interestingly, there is the uh, the psychodynamic way of understanding something like psychopathy, which we, we see it as very much related to the environment, to how the person was raised. There's certainly something there. There's definitely research that tracks, I mean, many, many psychopaths had horrendously abusive childhoods. I, I don't know what the chapter and verse is on that, but it's not hard to find that research. There's also research that shows that there's a significant hereditary part of it. So uh, it's it's interesting because I think we can we can see people who, probably in our own lives, we all know people who maybe map onto this dark triad. And we might see in some people that it comes from a deep suffering and lack. And other people, it just uh, just may kind of be how they were built. There may be something about our culture that encourages it. You find a lot of these people do well mm -hmm. in corporations. And I, I think that it's because that these traits in small amounts are adaptive. I mean, it's not a bad thing to be able to be strategic. That can help you get places in the world. Um, hopefully you can do it in an ethical way and stay connected with yourself and other people while you're doing it. But there is a time to be strategic. There is a time to be Machiavellian. I, I'm sort of casting back and thinking about people that I've personally known who maybe fit this description and realize that, you know, they can look, they can present in very different ways. And I'll go back to... Um build on the theme I introduced a little while ago about the depersonalization in today's culture, that we have all kinds of technical stuff, technological stuff. We meet on Zoom. People are having difficulty going back to the office. Corporations are very large, uh, somewhat impersonal entities. Uh, you know the people in your department and the people that are on the same floor, sort of, kind of. Uh, so that social interaction, social constraints are really not as powerful today as they used to be even 20, 25 years ago. And the, the less actual contact we have, the less of an interpersonal field is really created, the less impact it has. And it can help to reinforce an inflated, ego-oriented kind of person and a person who is not well-related because the culture is not facilitating that. You know, Deb, what, what that makes me think of, and again, I'm going to probably botch this a little bit, but... Um, I remember reading something really interesting about the 2008 housing crash because there were all of the, the ways that mortgages happen now. You know, you get a mortgage from a bank, but that mortgage can package that 
at that uh, liability and sell it to someone else. And like, it's enormously complicated. And the person who's actually sort of, um, I guess, I don't know, holding your, your, your debt is so far removed from you. It's so impersonal that uh, to default on your loan, you don't have any sense of the impact that it's having, nor do the people selling these kind of predatory mortgages really have any sense of the impact they were having on individuals. Contrast that with the way banking may have happened, I don't know, 70 years ago when you went down to the local, your local branch and you borrowed money and maybe you knew the people that worked there and mm-hmm. you know the people in the community knew you. It was like unthinkable to, to default on a mortgage. It was just very interesting, but I think it goes exactly to your point that when, when we don't, we don't have any, re- these interactions are not mediated relationally. There's no relationship there. So therefore we don't have a sense of the impact of our actions on another person. So there is a way that our culture kind of rewards these dark triad traits because of that. If we don't feel that the people around us know us, see us and care, seems to give people a kind of license to say, well, um, you know, everyone for themselves, every man for himself, every woman for herself. Uh, Whereas if you know that this is going to impact the neighbor who lives across the street from you, it's much more immediate and it's much more of a constraint. I'm finding myself moving in a particular direction as our conversation is evolving around these two ideas of being amoral and cynical. And I just, I'm just holding that. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and that the dark triad traits all seem to circle around, for instance, that quality of cynicism. Mm-hmm. I also think that that's something that is being cultivated in the collective, even rewarded, that there's something clever or humorous about being cynical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Which really dismisses the human capacity for compassion, for altruism, and any number of the other virtues. It often claims that those virtues are somehow false or just a form of virtue signaling. And it's pernicious. I I think of periods in my own life where I have been overly caught in cynicism, often clearly as just a defense around misfortune of one kind or another. Yeah, I I think that's interesting, Joseph. I'm I'm sort of musing on that idea about uh, cynicism as a defense. I I think it's also possibly, and I guess I'm thinking about it personally and also how it might operate in the collective. Cynicism is a defense against vulnerability because it's really a way of saying, I don't care. I, I don't. I don't want to open myself up to being wounded. So I'm gonna. I'm going to devalue that thing that I don't have. It's a defense against disappointment uh, that I have not been cared about, and I think many many people feel uh, that this is a very impersonal world and that they are not cared about by big systems and. Uh, you know, it's sort of all the social mas- machinery, cultural machinery, if you will, and that our feeling life of feeling connected, valued, seen, and it has really uh, been impacted, and we're disappointed. And then we erect a defense like cynicism. Well, I don't care anyway. So I'm th- I'm thinking about the difference between cynicism pessimism and nihilism, which are all like three bedfellows. Yeah. Almost like, you know, the three dark Mm -hmm. witches in the woods, you know, that cynicism is dangerous because cynics feel deeply distrustful of the world and of people, but they think that's an act of wisdom. Mm -hmm. That if you just pay attention to everything, it's obvious 
that trust is just ridiculous, and by abandoning trust, you're being wise. And I think in some ways that's really, really difficult because we can easily collect evidence and <laughs> collect fans to yeah. join us in that realm. Pessimism, I think, is a distrust in potential successes that it's just never going to go the way that I would hope. I'm going to set a goal and the goal will just never be reached. And I think that also comes out of certain family deprivations, all kinds of struggling that we all go through. It's a sense of defeated being. And I think nihilism, which is the darkest of all of them, is just the belief that anything in life has any value. So all of those are injuries to our ability to feel. They're injuries to our emotional center. Uh, and ultimately, that is what makes us human. Uh, we, we like to think that it's our cognitive or rational capabilities <laughs> that, that make us uh, distinguished and individual. But without heart, without feeling, without being able to experience all of those disappointments, humility, vulnerability, weaknesses, and feel seen, heard, cared about in all of that, I think it contributes mightily to this dark triad. Underneath is an ocean of unfelt feelings. And we can imagine that the antisocial traits are a defense against feeling or being vulnerable to feeling. That when we think of narcissists, psychopaths, or Machiavellian business or politi political um, folks, that all of that has to marginalize or vaporize feeling in order to keep marching forward. And I think for most people who devolve into those strategies, in some ways it's because they were subject to intolerable feelings mm -hmm. and consequently still lack a kind of emotional regulation. And so feelings in general become demonized. Anything that makes them feel can be experienced as an attack. And depending on their temperament or their predisposition, they can launch substantial defenses to make sure that all those pesky feelings are put away. There's a quote uh, from Marie-Louise von Franz that I think speaks to, to some of this, especially what you were saying earlier, Joseph, about um, cynicism. She says, it is by no means difficult to be a blind idealist nor a cynical realist but it is difficult and desirable to see, without illusion, reality as it is, and yet to nourish the inner flame and keep it high. Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. Hard. <laughs> yeah. to keep it the center of all things, undoubtedly. So I, I, want, I want to just explore something and invite the two of you to come along with me. Um, Joseph, I'm, I'm going back to something that you said earlier about... Uh, that maybe you said it in the introduction that these people with dark triad traits will kind of gravitate to uh, maybe political movements or religious movements. And I, I suspect that that's true because again, it's about power seeking. So you're going to kind of go where there is the potential to gain power, but these are also places that are, you know, political and religious movements are something that can connect us with something larger than self they're, they're something that can provoke in us the uh, religious function of the psyche. We can have very strong kind of oceanic feelings of belonging or significance when we get connected with a religious or political or ideological movement. 
And in fact, um, research has shown that dark triad individuals tend to uh, often support kind of more extremist ideologies. The interesting thing is the research makes clear that they support re, uh, extremist ideologies on both the right and the left. So it, sometimes it feels like it's easier to see how this operates on the right, but I, I think it might operate on the, the left too, just almost in a kind of mirror way. And so what I suspect is happening is that some of the loudest, well, some of the leaders of these extremist ideological movements probably are made up of dark triad folks, whether or not, and, and, and they find followers. And part of the reason they find followers is because they are good at manipulation, but also because they've found something that they can claim that has a grain of truth in it that, that really is uh, righteous or progressive or um, whatever it is. And, and the rest of us can resonate with what they're saying and feel we're, it's like we're drawn, to, we're drawn to the central fire that they're standing next to in a way. So, you know, they're, they're drawing our eye towards something that really does have the capacity maybe to connect us with something positive, but we don't necessarily know that we're being duped. And then I think we're in this realm where we see anyone who doesn't disagree with us as evil, because that's what a Machiavellian personality does or a dark triad personality does is um, split and project. And therefore, uh, once everything they don't want to know about themselves is split off and projected onto the enemies. We're all good and they're all bad. And that's what these leaders are, are telling us and we can get drawn in. So um, I, I'm curious about the way that these personality traits can kind of shelter in political or religious movements, which Joseph, you mentioned in the introduction and how easy it is for the rest of us to become followers of these folks and wanting to retain an awareness that the thing that we think we're signing on for does have a positive element in it. But what we need to watch out for is when we start demonizing the other side, when we convince ourselves that people who disagree with us are actually evil. So what this calls up for me is how uh, all of these kinds of ideologies and right-wrong uh, depend on splitting off shadow. Yeah, yep. A and that we gravitate to like-minded others who validate a particular opinion, ideology, value system, whatever it is, and that further separates us not only from our own shadow, but from the feeling life mm -hmm. that we have abandoned in our protest that I am right and you, whoever those yous are, are, are wrong and bad. Uh, we've split ourselves off from ourselves in constructing uh, value systems, groups, ideologies, etc., uh, where there is this right, wrong, us, them kind of dynamic. So the splitting phenomena has to do with, with a lack of tolerance inside of oneself, that whatever the bad thing is inside of us creates so much conflict that we then imagine putting it into someone else and reacting with a kind of physical or psychological violence against it. And that's really going on inside of the person. So let's say they've been raised in an environment where sexuality is demonized in all of its forms, and they've internalized a kind of attacking, violent attitude towards their own sexuality, that tension can rise and rise, and then when they find an opportunity to put all of their demonized sexuality in another person, 
they treat that other person with the same violence with which they hammer at it inside of themselves. And it feels very familiar to them and easy to do because it's been happening in their inner world perhaps for decades. So we're scapegoating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we disown in ourselves, we project onto the other. Mm -hmm. It's like we're all capable of doing it. We all do it all the time probably. And maybe one of the ways that that we can sort of catch ourselves when we're doing it is to be curious when we feel um, outrage. It's interesting, Lisa, I was about to say the same uh, kind mm-hmm. of thing a little differently of just okay. to note the emotional intensity mm-hmm. with which, mm-hmm. you know, those people, it's completely outrageous. Did you read in the paper today where blah, 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 blah. Uh, Just note how intensely you feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then stop and reflect and say, whoa, this really got my goat, uh, the proverbial scapegoat. And what Mm -hmm. is going on in me that I feel about this such a degree of outrage or uh, fury or blame or whatever it might be? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's not that that's not happening, mm. uh, but our degree of emotional arousal is a, a, a cue and a clue mm. to uh, look in the psychological mirror. And that the goal of a reasonably integrated person is that they move with some amount of calmness and nonviolence through their inner and outer environment that they're dealing with reality, but the intense hyperarousal rarely happens unless there's real life-threatening circumstance. So if people are behaving in these exaggerated ways because they just heard something or thought they heard something or caught a glimpse of something, then we know that there is a pre-existing developmental or psychological disorder inside of them. One of the things that really troubles me about what's happening culturally is that we seem to have lost contact with the value of resilience. So when somebody has a characterologic defect character disorder, one of the pernicious beliefs that they have is that the environment should change in order to regulate me. So to let that really sink into the listeners, anytime you're around somebody who's hammering on the environment to make them calm, comfortable, satisfied, feel better about themselves, convince them that they are omnipotent, can do anything, or will give them anything that they desire. All the ways that people hammer on other people and other systems is a sign of illness. Mm. And in many cultures, particularly our culture, that has been become so misunderstood that entire systems are reshaping themselves in order to accommodate these psychological problems and wounds. I think what you said is really uh, so important, Joseph. That I'm going to reiterate it. You correct me if I didn't, don't get it quite right, that it is a sign of emotional immaturity if we expect the environment to regulate us. I think that's right on the money. Other people have to believe this. Other people have to meet my need. Other people have to speak, quote, correctly, unquote, and heaven only knows what that is, uh, in order for me to be okay. My being okay is up to me. And the way it's slid into the culture is that 
the environment must make me comfortable or I will destroy you. I'm going to say that several times. The environment must make you comfortable or else you will destroy it. Yes. If we really listen to that, those are the words of people who are Mm -hmm. suffering greatly with some kind of psychological unwellness. Yeah. Whether that's developmental or whether it's brought on by trauma, people deserve our support. They deserve access to treatment. But we have to see it as a symptom. It calls up for me the importance of differentiating between, um, you know, what I do and how I feel. I think this happens all the time um, in people, you know, of, let's say a, a couple, you know, and one person says, well, you know, if, if you really loved me, uh, you would, you know, do X or Y or Z. And the distinction is, uh, you know, for that person to be able to say, I do really love you. And I don't agree that I should do X or Y or Z, or I can't do X or Y or Z. Uh, And that gets uh, really conflated in uh, the equation that that you're just talking about, Joseph, of um, if you don't do what I want you to do, if you don't act the way I think you should act and talk the way I think you should talk, then I will destroy you because the environment, the you out there, should meet my needs according to um, you know, my dictates. No. There's some discernment needed, right? Because in Deb, I'm picking up on something you said a couple of weeks ago that I keep on thinking about, which is like, is the problem an inner problem or mm-hmm. is there a problem from like an outer problem? And of course it's it's not it's not always so clear, you know, that it's that's a little bit of an artificial distinction, clearly. But, but that, that's an, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves. Is my distress primarily something that's happening in the inner world that's about me? Or is it something, you know, to what extent is it coming from the environment? I mean, if I, let's say, receive disappointing news that I didn't get into the college I wanted to get into, obviously there's, that's a problem from the outside world. But then there's, I guess, a pro- the, the, there's also the issue of how I take that in and what I do with it. And, you know, therapy has always focused more on the inside problem than the outside problem. It's not that we don't care about the outside problems. We just acknowledge that there may be limited things we can do about outside problems. We, we probably can't get that college to change their minds about us. And so then what do we, what do, we do with the givens and, and Joseph going back to you know, I think I think it's you put it in such a good way, and I want to go back to what you said about us demanding that the environment change, is that there's a way that the current culture, when you talk about it sort of destroying resilience, encourages us to see all problems as out there problems, which does reduce resilience because there are some problems we can't do anything about except work on what we do with them on an inner level. And that can make a huge difference. Last week, I talked to two different people suffering from the same problem. I will say that it was a problem that was a terrible problem to have that um, there was nothing they could do about it or, or virtually nothing they could do about it. And, and one person was so distraught and so collapsed and, and suffering so greatly. And I, I feel tremendous empathy for this person. But she was very focused on how do I fix it? 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 I, I was trying to help her see that, you know, the, the job might be to accept. And then how do you come to terms with it? The other person, same situation. Uh, she was also suffering but she was suffering much less. And she said, you know, I've done what I can. And uh, here we are. And now I'm, I'm going to just, you know, keep on putting one foot in front of the other because I've done everything I can. This goes to um, the gestalt idea of optimism, mm. uh, which is not that everything's coming up roses, but it really correlates with what you were saying, Joseph, and you too, Lisa, about resilience. Of How do we find a place to stand in ourselves 
while seeing clearly and realistically what is going on out there. The difficult news, the disappointments, you know, whatever it is that has happened has happened. And I have a place to stand inside myself. I'm here and I will find uh, resources within to weather this hardship, to redirect my attention, because I have a stance that's internal. And if we have ourselves inside, then um, what happens in the external world uh, loses its sort of all-important, determinative power over us. I'm here, seeing clearly, and with, with an internal stance that allows me to accept what can't be changed. As I'm listening, we've started with a kind of psychological problem around an inadequate capacity to manage one's own self-regulation to other areas about whether or not we can achieve our ends or find in the environment the resources we want or to succeed reasonably as we compete for resources in the world. And I just want to make a clear demarcation that being somewhat ambitious is a wonderful thing for someone. You to try to get into a college, you try to get into, try to find a job, we try to get the skills to compete, you know, in the, in the world. We want our kids to be able to be out there. All of that is perfectly reasonable. And we're talking about that accommodation of reality. Sometimes the system just won't accommodate us. There aren't enough desks, you know, in the, in the freshman class for Yale to meet, you know, the other 4,000 people that applied and really might even deserve to go are equally competent. So finding a way to be resilient to just the limits of life is, is definitely reasonable. I think I'm talking about a, a more extraordinary outlier where people really have a characterologic misstructuring and treat the environment as it, it as if it should be the parent of an infant and try to strangle the environment to behave like the parent of an infant and just the way infants do the rage and tumult and protest that a baby will make appropriately so because they're a baby but then when adults start doing that and then the system feels forced to take on that role of the early infant parents. It hobbles its ability to function at its best. Mm -hmm. It limits what other people can get out of the system. So, for instance, maybe you're at a conference and there's 600 people in a huge conference room. And one person says that it's too cold. And most everybody else finds it comfortable. But the person that says it's too cold decides they're going to go up and complain to the operations person, complain to the speaker, begin to talk to groups inside of the conference to see if people will agree with them, and then to kind of mount you know, an, an aggressive movement to turn the thermostat you know, from 70 to 78. And it doesn't matter whether other people are sweating or falling asleep or whether it causes great difficulty for other people. But the individual that's caught in the infant place thinks it's perfectly reasonable for the entire conference hall to be set at a temperature that's right for them. And it doesn't occur to them to go up to their room and get a jacket. They shouldn't have to do that because... Babies can't do that. You know, when a baby's mm -hmm. cold, you can't kind of crawl out of the crib and go to the closet and you know, put on a jacket. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're going to lament to the parents. But people that are caught in this dark triad 
situation actually haven't discovered much of their own true agency to meet their needs. And they're hammering on other people to get that done. So there are, I would say, three pernicious beliefs that dark triad folks indulge in. And sadly, the collective seems to cheer them on. Yeah. The narcissistic belief is, I can and should be perfect. Mm. Just don't let that sink in. I can and should be perfect. And I'm going to hammer on the environment to provide an illusion, if nothing else, that I'm perfect. And I will not tolerate or I will attack anything that doesn't affirm the perfection and that I also deserve the resources to become as perfect as possible. The most egregious example might be a disastrous amount of plastic surgery, but there's many, many other ways that people can demand that the environment tell them that they are perfect. And the rage that comes from a a narcissistically inclined person, if that doesn't happen, I can and should be perfect. The psychopathic belief is I can make anything happen. Now, in a lot of motivational environments, people are fed that belief. See, it's wonderful. You can make anything happen, anything at all. But underneath that is an infantile omnipotence. And when that is put into a psyche that has no restraint, a psyche that has no empathy, a psyche that has lost all connection to its humanity, I can make anything happen, becomes a belief that's central to a psychopath. And there are no limits to what they might do to experiment and prove that to themselves. Because of the void that they're in, they're also having this enormous need for stimulation. Boredom, a kind of life-threatening boredom, is pervasive in psychopaths. So they can believe anything, they can make anything happen, and they want the environment to prove that to them. They will take terrible actions on other people to prove to themselves they can make anything happen. And the Machiavellian attitude is, I can own anything I want, including people. And I will hammer on the environment to prove that to me. I can and should be perfect. I can make anything happen. I can own anything I want. Those three attitudes come together in a kind of soup inside our environments. And when that takes over, I can launch people to act on each other in a way that can be scary. So that's really interesting, Joseph. And so the thing that those three beliefs have in common is that there's no, there are no limits. I want to uh, maybe try to apply that to a, a little bit of an example, which I don't know, maybe it's controversial, but it, it feels like it's kind of taking it down into something that, that is, you know, a real experience. By the way, as someone who's cold all the time, I definitely would be in favor of turning the heat up in the conference <laughs> hall. But um, back a number of years ago, this probably would have been in, I don't know, 2013, 2014, somewhere in that neighborhood, I had a reason to uh, spend some time on the social media platform Tumblr, which I suspect is, is one of these places where some dark triad traits were rewarded. For those of you don't, that don't know, I think it's less popular now, but back then it was a social media platform that um, was used mainly by, I, I would say, teen and tween girls. So, so I was on it and, and then there, I was kind of following, I was, you know, what is this thing sort of thing. I was looking at this discussion about cultural appropriation 
Now, I don't want to comment on cultural appropriation. I think that that is a, a discussion that is well worth having, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. What I was struck by was the tone of the conversation. It really caught my attention because it was so shrill. I had never seen anything like this before. And of course, now, you know, you just open up Twitter and that same tone is everywhere. But this was the first time I had run across this tone of just kind of scathing, righteous superiority. You know, it was something I'm just going to kind of make it up. But like uh, someone maybe had worn a T-shirt with a print on it that kind of looked vaguely Native American and was just being kind of uh, torched, just excoriated with just kind of post after post after post sort of shaming this person. And again, I have no doubt that the people participating in the pylon genuinely felt like they were doing something good, that they were righting a moral wrong in the world. What I suspect is that somehow the, the leaders of these pylons, at least sometimes, may be dark triad people. And then the rest of us follow because, again, there is a, there is a kernel of, of, of something valuable there that we see. So it brings me to this idea about influence. You know, influence is something that uh, I certainly didn't learn very much about when I was in my training to be a therapist or an analyst but in my years since, it comes up a lot. I worked in domestic violence. Well, domestic violence is a field in which influence is very important. And actually, dark triad traits are important there too. Because one of the things that happens, if you know anything about domestic violence, is it's not just physical violence. There is a whole psychological, uh, I, I, I want to avoid the word grooming because it's, it's just way too freighted. But there's a, there is a way that the abuser will cause the, the, the other person to doubt herself. I'm going to use that pronoun because it's usually that way. Not always, not always for sure. Um, the abuser will cause uh, the person to doubt herself, to get to cut off from other sources of support so that she becomes isolated and more vulnerable. There is a whole range of psychological manipulations that usually precedes any physical violence. Influence is everywhere. It's not always bad, but we are all influenceable and there are bad influences. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the fairy tale Fitcher's Bird, which is uh, a Grimm's tale and it's very much like Bluebeard. And in Fitcher's Bird, uh, there are three, we, we just know that there are these three sisters living in this house and the, there is a sorcerer who dresses up as a beggar which is a very interesting image because he's powerful and yet he appears as if he has nothing. So he's immediately, we know he's manipulative. He knocks on the door, he's begging, and the first sister gives him a piece of bread. And as soon as she gives him the bread, he is able to touch her and immediately she jumps into his basket. So this is an image of when we naively give away our power to someone who is a manipulator, uh, they can kind of do whatever they want with us. So she's in the basket. He carries her home. You know, he's got this beautiful house. And she's like, this is great. And she's living with him. And then one day he gives her an egg and a key. And he says, um, you can go in any room you want except for this one. Oh, and also, by the way, always keep that egg with you. So, of course, she goes into the forbidden room in which she finds the chopped up bodies of many previous women. She drops the egg in the blood. The blood doesn't come off. And then he knows that she went in the forbidden chamber and then he chops her up and so on. But I, I think it is a real image of us falling under the influence of something that is powerful. He is a sorcerer. So there's real power there, but we've given away, we've given ourselves away to it too much. It's the downside of us being social animals mm -hmm. and uh, that there's a real contagion effect 
Oh, we all feel it. You know that when uh, something really sad happens, that perhaps we go to a memorial service for someone who is deceased. Uh, we feel those feelings. Uh, we go to a wedding and there's a celebration after the ceremony. We feel those feelings. Uh, we are very seducible. We are very prone to influence. And we, we need to be judicious about, wait a minute, what am I doing? What am I doing? In Bluebeard, he has a blue beard. And mm-hmm. the sisters at first are like, yeah, I don't really know. This guy has a funny colored beard. But eventually, <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but eventually one of the sisters is like, he's, you know, but he's really rich, so maybe I'll just go with him. But it's like, no, but he's got a blue beard. You probably should have listened to that, you know? But it's like how we give away our power to people who have these traits, it's, there, it's, there's that word again, too, power. I'm just noticing that. You know, I want to go um, in the opposite direction. Use something that's out there in the culture to present a contrast to the dark triad, <laughs> just so we give some way to um, uh, the other side of this. The, there's an assessment that has become very popular. It's on Wikipedia. It's everywhere online called The Big Five. And you can pay, and it's a self-assessment, and uh, you can investigate it if you're curious. But here are the characteristics that this very popular measure of basic integrity, maturity, a a certain kind of uh, wholeness that's out there. They They measure your openness to experience. Are you inventive? Are you curious? willing to take a look. Conscientiousness. Is the person, you, efficient, organized, diligent, uh, willing to persist? Uh, They call it extroversion, by which they mean, are you outgoing? Are you energetic? Can you take an interest in the world? Uh, Look outside, and that goes back to being curious. Agreeableness, they call it, uh, by which they mean, are you friendly? Are you compassionate? And then the last one they call neuroticism, but what they really mean is emotional stability. You know, are, are you resilient? Well, Joseph was talking about this. So here, here's an interesting number of contrasts to having a sense of self that can take a look, that can notice a blue beard, that can be resilient, that has an inner stance, that can take in other people, be influenced and also be judicious about, wait a minute, what am I doing? Let's think, you know, thinking and feeling and that capacity for reflection. Nobody wants to be in the position of the young woman who winds up in the basket of the sorcerer. I'm thinking about the fairy tale. I'm thinking about the dark triad and the larger pathologies around all of that. And it brings up the topic of trust because the whole dark triad qualities and their larger, more serious pathologies all circle around violations of trust and then later the inability to trust. And trust not in the way that an infant might go through the world with a kind of innocence, but that we have a kind of informed trust. Informed because we pay attention to reality around us. We pay attention to our body, pay attention to the insights of other people. That we also have a kind of memory that permits a reasonable and flowing narrative about ourselves. So all of these dark human traits have another strange phenomenon connected to them, is the disruption of cogent associations and memories that narcissists, psychopaths, 
Machiavellian-behaving folks, all in my book show evidence of attachment problems, attachment disorders. One of the things that's visible in attachment disorders is people often have few or no memories of their childhood, or they have highly selective memories. If we have suffered substantial abuse, and that does happen, people might have five memories about their childhood, and all of them are terrible memories of abuse, but they also have tens of thousands of other memories of themselves and about the environment and about people in the neighborhood who were kind to them or moments they felt peaceful when they were riding their bike and that the ego is deprived of an actual full narrative of the life and consequently that falsely gives them a kind of distorting lens. And when they look through the distorting lens, because they're missing a full magnitude of actual memories, the distorted lens convinces them that nothing can be trusted, no one can be trusted, that life cannot be trusted, and that gives them permission to act in whatever way they deem is in their best interests. So it's a slow process pulling ourselves out of these dark traits if we notice them in ourselves. It's very difficult to change someone who is deeply influenced by these darker traits, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. One of the things that can be quite problematic is that each of the different traits requires a different therapeutic engagement. For instance, if somebody has a preponderance of psychopathy, sympathy and kindness is interpreted as weakness, and that individual will begin to see him, to see the empathic one as prey. So in that environment, the therapist has to become very clear, has to focus with a kind of impeccable integrity and a kind of unshakable, potent groundedness. But the narcissist often is starving for empathy, really needs active listening, needs to have their best potentials mirrored and beckoned forward so they can enter into life in a much more full way. And they respond very, very well to accurate empathy. And that's the trick because the narcissist is doing a bit of sleight of hand. So the narcissist maybe has curated a really beautiful physical appearance. And they really want everyone to talk about how wonderful and beautiful and handsome they are, fit they are. And that props up the false self. So the mirroring for the narcissist has to go much deeper than that and see nuances of humanity that are peeking out from behind the false self and mirror that, which can be unnerving, but something the narcissist is starving for. And the Machiavellian individual, if we just look at uh, that essay, The Prince, written by Machiavelli, which is written in a much more ancient and dangerous world. Its primary focus is to facilitate self-preservation. If you are the regent in a war-torn Italian area, and I'm not sure when this was written, several hundred years ago, you're just trying to survive, making sure that you don't get your head chopped off of and your kids don't get murdered by the next group over that's competing with you. So the Machiavellian person needs constant evidence that their self-preservation is not at risk. All of those interventions could be summarized as efforts to instill basic 
trust. Trust that you can be seen as you truly are and will be enjoyed and affirmed. Trust that you will be helped, your needs will be met, that your life is not at risk. And trust that you can engage the environment in a way that enriches you and enlivens you and that you can experience pleasure in the autonomy of life. All of that is possible slowly and over time. During those kinds of interventions, the individual cannot safely fall asleep. If you're dealing with a dark triad person, if you're dealing with somebody who has more of those full and dangerous personality disorders, you have to stay awake. And that will allow you to trust yourself as you navigate what can be very complicated environments. Well, and that leaves us on a, on a somber but hopeful note. And I wonder if it makes sense for us to switch to a dream. The unconscious probably has a solution for all of this. <laughs> Before we switch to a dream, um, I would like to thank our patrons. Uh, those of you who listen and, and appreciate the podcast and go on our website, thisjungianlife.com, and sign up for a contribution, uh, it is much appreciated. Um, for those of you who listen and like what we're saying, uh, we hope you too will just go to our website and and sign up and uh, support us, um, however modestly and generously you can. Thank you. Today's dreamer is a man who's 25 years old, uh, who's currently not working but is traveling internationally. And here's the dream. I'm exploring an unknown apartment building. I walk to the end of a long hallway into a wood-paneled room with large bookshelves. As soon as I enter the room, a numinous feeling overtakes me. I'm intimidated by this energy, but intrigued. I continue further into the room. I find a record player along the back wall. I make three counterclockwise laps around the room. I do so deliberately in the dream. And then I start to play a record. As the music starts, I collapse onto the floor in some sort of trance and begin having visions. I come out of my trance, make three clockwise laps around the room, and exit. I go downstairs into a room full of people eating around a large dining room table. I don't want people to know where I've been. I sit down at the table and try to act normally. I know I shouldn't have been in the room with the bookshelves. I have taken food with me from the room with the bookshelves, and I know that I am supposed to eat it. I don't want anyone to know that I have it. I put it on my plate and mix it in with the other food. An old man walks up to me. He knows where I've been and sees what's on my plate. He doesn't confront me, but I know that he knows. I eat some of the meat I brought with me. I think it is human flesh. I'm a little off-put by its texture and take only a small bite. Later, someone announces to the group that no one is allowed to enter the room with the bookshelves. It seems taboo to do so. All of these people appear to be part of some religion, and the leaders are apparently threatened by the room. I want to go back into it, but I'm worried I'll be caught doing so. I fear that I'll be tortured if I'm found breaking the rule. Eventually, I have to go back into the room for some reason. I have the same feeling upon entering the room, as if some supernatural force takes a hold of me. I am surprised to find that there are other people in the room. There seems to be some sort of party happening, but nobody knows that they're actually in the forbidden room. I know, though. I walk back to the record player. 
There's an African man standing next to it. I think he's a DJ for the party. He knows what the record player will do. He starts to slide a cloth over it as if he's cleaning it, looking knowingly at me while doing so. As he slides the cloth over the record, music starts to play. I grab his hand and stop him. I want to participate in the ritual again, but this setting doesn't seem right. For context, he says, I can't think of any real-life context that relates to the content of this dream. I'm currently traveling internationally, and I will return to the U.S. in the fall to pursue a Ph.D. in mathematics. I have intense, symbol-rich dreams pretty regularly. The dream description provided above is abbreviated and excludes some of the original dream content. I feel a little intimidated by the mysterious room, but obligated to explore it. And then he adds, I know that counterclockwise and clockwise paths correspond to movement into the unconscious and conscious, respectively. I do not have any strong association with human flesh. I suppose an analogy could be drawn to Christ and the, quote, eating of his flesh, unquote, but I'm not a Christian and I'm only vaguely familiar with Christian rituals and texts. I mean, this is obviously a big dream. Um, yes. With a lot, of, a lot of elements. So, of course, you know, if I were going to give this dream a title, I would probably call it The Room. <laughs> so there's something about this room. There's something about this room, and it's notable because it is, uh, it has bookshelves. I'm going to assume that the bookshelves have books on them, although I don't think he says that, but I'm going to go with that. And so, therefore, we could say the significance of the room is it has something to do with knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's something here about the numinous quality of knowledge. And, you know, books are books are interesting as a symbol because... They are, of course, capable of preserving knowledge from a long time ago. The books are sort of repositories of, of human wisdom that can communicate truths that, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't necessarily learn ourselves, but we can learn from other people. So there's this sort of kind of sense of, of um, collective wisdom that gets transmitted through books. What came up for me around this dream was the theme of transgression. The dream ego's ambivalence about wanting to be in this room where something numinous happens, there's a supernatural force, but um, it's, it's against the rules. Uh, and there are, there's many a fairy tale uh, where the hero or heroine of the tale transgresses and it's in the interest of that heroine's uh, growth and development. The great one, of course, I think is Jack and the Beanstalk because it's just a casual transgression. He trades the cow for a bunch of beans and yet it's in the service uh, of uh, improving their life situation of course, then there's also the great transgression of Adam and Eve in the garden and the fall. Mm -hmm. And that, too, from a Jungian point of view, is seen as in the service of growth and, and development, although tremendous disillusionment and a much harder life than uh, sitting in the garden. But you know, Deb, that's a, that's such a great amplification because it it also has to do with acquiring knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Exa exactly. And that was the transgression: is they went to the tree mm -hmm. of knowledge of right. of a personal empowerment, and, and so I see that as uh, the dilemma uh, that the dream ego is faced with. Shall he acquire the knowledge? Shall he not? Will he align himself with the people in, in the group uh, where no one is allowed to enter the room with the bookshelves? It's taboo. 
Uh, will he be caught doing so if he goes back? I fear I'll be tortured if I'm found breaking the rules. So there's the breaking away from, uh, you know, the conventional group uh, rules and regs. And then he does go back and it's a party. It's a dance party with a DJ. <laughs> so this is a kind of, uh, you know, watering down the significance. So maybe it's just a party and it's not that big a deal. Um, it's as if the psyche is trying to find a way to say, well, you know, you could kind of have half a loaf. You can go in the room as long as you don't take it too seriously. And, and heaven forfend, look at all those books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's ambiguous. I mean, I, I also note importantly, right, that somehow the fruit of the room of knowledge is human flesh. And I, th I think the dreamer is correct that this could be related to the mythology of Christ and, and what is, you know, commonly understood to happen at Catholic communion, which is that you're actually eating the body of Christ. And he says, well, you know, I, I don't really know much about Christian uh, symbolism or rites, but the truth is you don't have to know much about them for those, for mythological ideas to work on you because they are archetypes and they're, therefore they are true in some psych psychological sense. And they are true for all of us, whether or not we, uh, you know, were raised in that religion. So there's, there's something archetypally true about eating the flesh, you know, which is, I guess, I guess similar to eating the apple by, by uh, analogy. And also in the communion ceremony, there is a sanctification of this, uh, whereas our dreamer just snitches it for himself. Maybe. He says, I, I, you know, he takes the food with him. And I think that's the great question is, is this in the interest yeah. of his own growth and development to take this upon himself mm -hmm. in a clandestine way? And the dream ego experiences his own ambivalence about this. Is ooh, I don't know. Is it okay? Is it not okay? Mm -hmm. There's the old man, and then there's the African man, and they seem to carry a similar spirit, where mm. they they kind of look at him knowingly. Both of them are kind of on to him, mm -hmm. and I think you're right. Deb. I think maybe both of those two characters are aspects, perhaps, of the self, kind of warning him that he doesn't have quite the right attitude toward. The mm. Mysteries of the Unconscious. I found myself, in addition to all you've said, I'm also really curious about the paneled room and what seems to be empty bookshelves. I'm curious about the trance state that he falls into. I'm curious that he leaves the room with food, not books. Mm -hmm. And there's this task to metabolize something mm -hmm. that he doesn't quite understand. So he goes to a special place, he goes into some kind of a trance state against his will, and then he returns and he has to try to ingest something. If I step way back and just look at that cycle, it sounds like analysis. <laughs> sounds like finding some kind of perhaps repressed material and finding a way to have a relationship to it. He mentions religion. And all the people appear to be some kind of a religion, and the leaders are apparently threatened by the room. So again, this is pure speculation. But I'm wondering if part of what this young man is working with is moving beyond some kind of limits that his religion of his childhood has put in place. So much of our religious belief system is integrated when we're very, very young, which makes sense because it's probably our most neuroplastic time. So when I was going to Sunday school as a kid and I was being told that Jesus is a lamb, I'm sitting there looking at that picture of a lamb with like a crucifix nestled, you know, into its crook of its front leg and I'm really struggling how to make sense of all of that 
And of course, they're giving us very fundamental and peaceful Christian ideas. I was raised Catholic. The difficulty is that those fairly unsophisticated and childlike ideas wind up getting inserted into the psyche. And even though we become much more sophisticated as adults, we're often left with a platform of a child's version of a religion. And so we tend to think of God as being an old guy that looks kind of like Santa Claus or Jesus being a lamb. So at some point, at the very least, we have to deconstruct the religion of our childhood and challenge it to become a religion of adulthood, which means we have to think about it in much more sophisticated ways. And so I'm kind of wondering if as this fellow is uh, pursuing his PhD in mathematics and he's going through a really profound internal process, that the psyche also wants him to challenge certain boundaries of thinking and belief, which he may not even realize were in place, to try to learn something new and metabolize it, which may require stretching beyond the religion of the childhood. I have a fantasy which is totally not present in the dream that there are books there, but they're invisible. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.